Rob McIsaac, uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule today to um, preview the release of your appearance on our Accelerating Business podcast next month. And uh, in doing that, um, first of all, allowing us to catch up with you on how things are going with you and your colleagues at Hamilton Health Sciences. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, I, it's a good question. Uh, we've been working for a fair number of days in a row, but I think um, we, we're hanging in there, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm proud of uh, what's been accomplished by my team and how well uh, they've been able to work together. Uh, I think everybody could use a break, uh, but uh, the job's not done yet. So I think we still have a few miles to go uh, before we can really, um, you know, take a deep breath uh, and, and feel like we've got everything in hand. Um, there continue to be, you know, fires burning in the community, even, even though we didn't get the, um, you know, the big tsunami we were worried about. Uh, there, there continue to be uh, real trouble spots in the community that we're trying to uh, to lend a hand to uh, bringing some stability towards. As we um, sit here to record this on April 29th, 2020, we're beginning to see some glimmers of hope uh, in terms of the reduction in the number of cases, especially in this region. What do you think um, the immediate future looks like for the hospital and the potential for the resumption of more normal aspects of its operation? It's a good question. Uh, and it's, I, I think, you know, finding uh, the right answer to that question is going to be very complex. Uh, and I think, you know, um, will be an exercise where, that will uh, not uh, please everyone uh, because, you know, we have limited, um, resources that we're going to have to allocate across a great many needs. Um, the, the, the challenge is that I think the virus continues to be in the community. It continues to infect people. Uh, and as long as that's the case, uh, and as long, unless and until we have a kind of population immunity to this virus, I think the hospitals, uh, in Hamilton and across the province, across the country, we'll have to continue to reserve some uh, space uh, and dedicate it towards the possibility of uh, a significant outbreak occurring within the community that we will have to respond to. So we can't go back to business as usual. We can't go back to operating at 120%. Um, at the same time, uh, we know that there are are many significant health needs uh, building up within a you know a cohort of um, uh, citizens, uh, community members that um, you know are equally uh, as significant and deserving of attention as uh, potential you know COVID nineteen patients. So, how to balance those two things off against one another? Uh, how to how to determine, you know, of that cohort, uh, who goes first, uh, who goes second, how do you develop priorities? Uh, it's, a, it's really a master class in um, ethics. Uh, so we are going to be trying to engage as many stakeholders in this uh, process as possible to figure out the, the most ethical uh, uh, best use of resource that the hospital has to to try to begin to reintegrate some of those clinical services that have been paused. I was inclined to ask, um, and I will rhetorically, whether and to what extent uh, you're going to have to draw on the expertise of a lot of lawyers in doing that, but I'm, I'm not going to oblige you to, to answer that. Um, in our podcast, which we're going to release, we explored a variety of issues, issues relating to leadership, and the running of an organization and in looking at what has happened, especially for you and Hamilton Health Science, there's no question that this would have severely tested both the leadership of the organization and its functioning in, in a variety of profound ways. While acknowledging that you're not entirely out of the woods yet and you'd need more time to reflect, 
Do you have an early impression as to where your organization displayed particular strength and success in riding the storm out? Well, I, you know, I think what has impressed me the most about uh, my team and their response has really been uh, twofold. First of all, their their um, agility to respond uh, to a fast moving and dynamic situation with this virus uh, in the early days to you know be trying to anticipate um, the course of the virus within our community uh, and then to free up uh, the number of beds uh, that we thought would be appropriate uh, given the, the path that we thought the virus was on. So that, that was a massive planning exercise uh, and getting ready for that and creating those spaces uh, both in and out of hospital um, was an enormous amount of work that required, you know, a huge uh, degree of uh, collaboration across all parts of the hospital. Uh, so, you know, I think if I had asked for that to be done, <laughs> Uh, in in normal times, people would have told me, "Sorry, just not possible." But because we had to do it, uh, it did get done. Uh, but really, on the on the uh, the strong backs of uh, you know so many people uh, at Hamilton Health Sciences who came together to do that heavy lifting. Um, and then I think as as this has has gone on. Um, you know, I think there's been amazing resilience uh, demonstrated uh, at, you know, day after day, uh, coming together to meet new challenges um, and bringing a very, you know, a really innovative uh, eye to solving uh, the, the great challenges of this crisis, uh, which in many respects have re revolved around a lack of uh, supply chain for some of the most critical supplies uh, and looking for alternative ways uh, to meet those needs. So it's been super challenging, but uh, very impressive to watch. How have you personally managed to maintain equilibrium as uh, the CEO of such a large organization going through such trying times? Well, and I still shave it. So. I, I, I hope that's not just the consumption of potato chips and beer. This is one day's growth. Uh, <laughs> I didn't shave this morning. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not sure I, I have totally maintained an equilibrium, but, um, you know, I think I'm going through what everybody's going through. The, the days kind of fly by because it's one meeting after another uh, from morning till night. Uh, and then in a strange kind of paradox, uh, while the days fly by, the weeks feel like months. Uh, because they're so long, but you know, try to stay in a routine. Uh, try to, to uh, work out uh, on a somewhat regular basis. I've got a little gym in my basement, so that's helpful. Um, and you know, uh, trying to stay in contact with friends by social media uh, to uh, keep some uh, humor in life. As life returns to some uh, semblance of normalcy, what is it that you're going to look forward to the most? Yeah, well, I really miss, you know, I miss my friends and my family and, um, and I miss, you know, being with my team. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending time with people again. I'm going to leave it at that and let you get back to work. Um, and I hope that you elude the viruses that are immediately behind you chasing you. I want to I want to thank you for taking the time, Rob. And and I think on behalf of of my colleagues and the community as a whole, would want you to extend our profound thanks uh, to your colleagues who've been on the front lines fighting this in Hamilton. It's incredibly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. You began with a degree in the law. Uh, did you ever practice as a lawyer? I did. I practiced. Uh, I started out um, on Bay Street for Goodman's, uh, which is you know kind of a, a mid-sized to mid-largish sized Bay Street law firm. Uh, very innovative firm, um, by the way. Uh, 
And uh, after about a year of practicing there as a lawyer, decided that I would go out on my own. Uh, so I came back to uh, Burlington, which is my hometown, and uh, set up my own practice, uh, which is a very challenging endeavor, actually, starting out a law practice from scratch. Um, and I practiced probably for um, about seven years. Uh, so a year uh, in Toronto and then another six years um, uh, in uh, pro you know, my own practice uh, and then ultimately uh, gave up uh, practicing law. Now, did you give up practicing law in pursuit of something else or uh, were you resigned not to practice law and then found something else? Yeah, I think uh, probably the, the best way to describe it is law. the practice of law got pushed out of my career uh, by other uh, endeavors. So um, I, I was elected uh, as a counselor uh, on city council in Burlington not long after I came back to set up my own practice. And so... I practiced law and sat on city council for six years. Uh, and then I became mayor uh, subsequent to that and tried to continue practicing law while I was mayor, but that was just, uh, was not working out very well. So decided uh, to give up uh, my practice. Now in reflecting on the entirety of your career and we'll go over it uh, over the course of the interview, Rob, um, it occurs to me to ask that uh, as to whether or not you felt that your legal education <clears throat> and career for, for the years in which you practiced as a lawyer has served you well in your public service role and in your business role. Do you have uh, an observation or reflection on that? Yeah, I, you know, um, when I speak to young people who are thinking about going to law school, I, I frequently encourage them to do so. And, and on the basis, not necessarily that they'll practice law, but on the basis that, uh, from my perspective, a legal education is a great setup for almost anything else you might do in life. So uh, I would say throughout my career, I've felt that my law degree has, in countless situations, given me an unfair advantage over you know, the people who I was dealing with. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a great setup for everything that I've done. In reflecting on it, and if you could, uh, would there be changes to the curriculum that you experienced at law school that would better position and resource lawyers who get into business in their careers or not? I think, um, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in the curricula of uh, uh, law schools today, but I do, I think that um, the notion of training lawyers to be leaders makes good sense to me. So if I was to supplement the curriculum that I took, uh, I think it would be giving lawyers, uh, you know, some in-school leadership training that, um, that, that I don't, I'm guessing still is not there. I mean, I know it's, it's very, uh, three years is not a lot of time uh, in some respects to teach everybody you'd like to teach them about uh, the law. Uh, but I do think leadership is a, is a critical skill, especially for those going, uh, you know, leaving the practice of law. Uh, you know, if you're in business or if, if you're in government, the, those leadership skills are so important. And we'll come back to the question of, of leadership a little bit later in the interview. In reflecting on your biography, virtually the entirety of your career has been spent in, in public service. Was that something that you had expected or intended? Was it an accident? Are you just masochistic? <laughs> I've loved uh, my work in the public sector uh, across my career. And, you know, for me, um, I'm still a camper. You know, I've, I started camping with my dad when I was a kid. And uh, I know it's, it's kind of corny, but um, the camper, camper's credo is to leave your campsite a little better than you found it. And, uh, that's sort of been my uh, ambition in every place that I've worked at is to try to leave it a little better than I found it. Uh, and in the process, hopefully start to create uh, or help create um, a better community. So uh, all of my jobs have really allowed me uh, to do that work of trying to, to make uh, both my workplace, but also the, the city uh, and region in which I lived a better place. And it, it's very gratifying work. Uh, and it's, I mean, that's work that uh, gets you out of bed in the morning for sure. 
Just touching on your political career for a moment uh, and tying that back into the life and career that you've had since, it, it occurs to me that in reflecting on a politician's life, certainly as a mayor or a leader, that you are spending a lot of time managing the expectations and mediating the expectations and interests of the business leaders in a community and those who live in a community. If you were giving advice to business owners, as, as we do from time to time, uh, about how to approach and deal with politicians or government in advancing their business interests, what would it be? Um, you know, I think that the mistake that I hear uh, most frequently made amongst people in business is that, you know, if they could only run government, um, they, they, they would do so, so much differently. And to me, you know, that attitude uh, belies a misunderstanding of how government works. Uh, you know, the road to uh, success in politics is littered with the bodies of businessmen who thought they could do it. Um, there, there's no doubt that the, you know, the rigor and discipline uh, um, and acumen that you, you use to be successful in business is helpful in government. Uh, there's no question about that. But there's this other whole set of um, criterion or, or uh, requirements for success in government that don't apply to business. And you need to understand uh, that government uh, has to play by a different set of rules for it to, to survive and succeed. Uh, and it's much more about uh, engaging broad sets of stakeholders, bringing them in uh, and working with them to develop solutions. And so, I, you know, my advice to business people would be uh, for sure, um, all of the standard things that you do in business around developing relationships, uh, you know, the, the, the standard set of negotiating skills that you would use uh, in doing a business deal are equally applicable in terms of dealing with government and dealing with politicians. But you need to understand that they, they also have this addi additional set of criteria that they're motiv motivated by and operating with. Um, and so you, you just need to be respectful of that, understand it. It's a given going in. Um, there are lots of people who are very uh, uh, shrewd about these things. So if you need help, uh, you can always get that help. Following your time as mayor, you transitioned to Metrolink. And for those that are unaware, what is Metrolink's? Uh, well, Metrolink started out initially uh, as um, uh, the body responsible for developing uh, a regional transportation plan uh, in Greater Toronto and Hamilton. Uh, the, the original vision, which has ultimately come to fruition, is that Metrolinks would also not only be a planner but also an operator. So, you know, today and, and while I was there, we we brought Go Transit under the wing of uh, Metrolinks, although um, that's a little bit like a, a mouse swallowing an elephant. Uh, Metrolinx was a fairly small or comparatively small team but, uh, when we merged with Go Transit, which was a which is a huge uh, undertaking. It's a railroad essentially, uh, but uh, Metrolinx is essentially the regional uh, planner and operator uh, for uh, mass transit. I think uh, again when we first started, there was a, a broader vision, which I I still uh, would subscribe to today that. You know, you, you can't look at transportation, modes of transportation in isolation. Uh, you know, every, every trip that a person takes involves a variety of modes of transportation, starting with your own legs as you leave your front door and get out to uh, whatever conveyance you're going to get to your next mode of transportation. So uh, we certainly involved ourselves when we were developing the regional transportation plan. We, we brought a very broad perspective to what transportation planning was about. And from my perspective at that time, uh, it, you know, uh, for sure it was about public transit, but it, it also uh, ultimately needed to think about uh, local roads, highways, um, sidewalks, uh, cycling, and so on. Uh, I, I, you know, I still believe today, if you, if you really want to be good at developing a, a transportation system, you have to have that multimodal view. Uh, it would seem on its face that transitioning from the position of mayor of Burlington to Metrolinx would 
present some different and unusual challenges as a leader organization. Uh, what can you share with us about what that was like and what you had to learn uh, either afresh um, or what you hadn't expected assuming the title of leader in Metrolinx when you transitioned from the city of Burlington? Well, when I was mayor, I really uh, came um, to the view that uh, as much as I was committed to serving my own city and my own city's interests, that um, you needed to take a broader view uh, of the city region uh, if, if you really wanted to be successful. Uh, and so, you know, I certainly uh, promoted and ultimately engaged in a number of regional planning exercises. So uh, under Premier Harris, uh, I was asked to join uh, what was then called the Smart Growth Panel for South Central Ontario and uh, uh, led the group that developed a growth plan uh, for South Central Ontario. So uh, that work ultimately became part of the province's places to grow uh, legislation. Uh, but it, it was really about looking uh, broadly uh, at growth um, and trying to take a you know that that uh, ten thousand foot view of what our city regions should look like. Uh, subsequent to that, under uh, Premier McGuinty, I was asked to chair a task force to um, uh, develop a plan for a green belt um, around the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which again was very interesting, uh, fascinating work. Very much about, it, whereas, you know, the places to grow work was about where should we grow, the, the green belt work was about where should we not grow. Uh, and so, you know, the third uh, leg of that stool uh, was really about transportation. Uh, how are we going to con connect all these things in a way that's uh, sensible? Uh, so for me, um, from a subject matter point of view, it felt like an, a, quite a logical progression in my career. And I, I certainly had a, a broad view of the city region and, and a recognition of its importance. Uh, so from that perspective, I felt uh, pretty well prepared. I, I, you know, I went into the mayor's job thinking I would do it for two terms. I, I do. I think politicians shouldn't stick around for too long. Uh, I was uh, persuaded to stay for three, uh, but by the end of the third term, I, I really felt like it was time for me to move on. That you know, I, I wanted to see what else was out there for me. The tra transportation is a very interesting sector. It has a culture all its own. I mean, most sectors do, but uh, there are some very quirky things about transportation. There, there are people who are crazy for trains and crazy for you know anything that runs on rails, uh, sort of transit geeks. Um, but it, it's it's actually a great sector, and uh, it, from my perspective, it, it's one of the few places where. If you think about the three uh, pillars of sustainability of you know the economy, uh, society, uh, and, and the environment, transportation, if you do a great job, you can affect all three in very profound ways, uh, including you know down to the level of make, giving mobility to people who wouldn't otherwise have it who and you know, without mobility, very difficult to, to make a good life for yourself. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, there, there was, there was tons to learn, but it was really interesting work. Uh, and you know, by the, I left not that long after we had developed a regional transportation plan for greater Toronto and Hamilton. So, uh, that was sort of one of my early objectives and I was able to get that done, uh, before moving on. Just to go back to a moment for uh, to the, um, the reference or comment you made regarding the economy as being one of the key pillars of, of the development of transportation infrastructure. There's no question that that infrastructure is a key driver of economic activity or a limiter of it in some circumstances. Uh, and and uh, looking back on all of that now, after years of having left the position at what has transpired in the corridor, uh, and, and Burlington's significance, actually, frankly, uh, as a neighboring community to Hamilton, whose economy is different from Hamilton's, and in many cases, residents and interests are different from those in Hamilton. Some have complained, of course, that there's still insufficient same-day rail transportation between Hamilton and Toronto, um, and others, perhaps, those train geeks might be wondering about whatever happened to the dream of high-speed rail. 
Um, do, do you think that we have come as far as we should? Um, do you anticipate that we will be making more or more rapid success in the years ahead, dealing with and improving that transportation infrastructure, uh, simply because many, I think, would share the view that it, it's not where it needs to be? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope so. Um, I, I do think that um, when I got to uh, Metrolinx, there had been, you know, an astonishing lack of investment in transportation for many decades uh, by the province. Uh, and so it, it was acting as a huge constraint on uh, growth in, a, in the, the city region, um, including Hamilton. Uh, I think, you know, th there it, it started with a, a you know, a, a north, a continent uh, wide preoccupation with roads over uh, public transit, whereas, as I stated earlier, like, I think you need to take a multimodal view. It should, can't be all roads, can't be all transit, but you, ha you have to have a thoughtful balance between. Uh, but from a transit point of view, there was, there was many decades where the province simply focused on, uh, uh, on roads uh, to the neglect of tra uh, transit. So, I do think that the, the McGuinty government started a reversal uh, of the attitude that the province has an important role to play in public transit. Uh, and I, I, th I think that uh, uh, mantra will carry on. Uh, the, the province is pretty firmly committed uh, to that business, even under the, the current, current government. I think uh, they're, they're getting into the business of subways. So uh, I, to me, that signals that they, they continue to recognize the importance of public transit. From a Hamilton point of view, uh, you know, I remember uh, th there's this great picture uh, it, from the north of the very north of Toronto, looking down Young Street, and it, it's a you know it's a very wide scale uh, picture. Uh, and as you look down that corridor, that Young Street corridor, you, you see these pockets of very intense growth. Um, and it kind of, you know, it goes up and down like this as you look and it, it carries on into the distance towards the lake. And what that picture tells you is the importance of subway stops. Every, every subway stop along that Young Street line had created this uh, intense hub of economic activity. Uh, and I think, you know, from my perspective, the, the GO train is the 905 subway. Uh, it, it is the key uh, transportation link between Hamilton and the rest of the city region. Uh, and, and I would argue, you know, uh, in, I mean, I think it's certainly increasingly becoming the case, but if you looked at the economies of the cities uh, where all day go, go train service has been extended, I think you would see this very positive economic uptick every time all day service gets kind of, uh, extended by another city. So, you know, I think that the single most important economic factor that you could introduce into Hamilton's equation would be the introduction of all day go service. It, it would have a, a huge impact uh, on this positive economic impact on the city. I think it would be enhanced uh, by the electrification uh, of that line. So I know you, you mentioned high speed train electrification, not the same as high speed. I think, you know, from my perspective, not to be not to become a transit geek here, but High-speed rail is really most appropriately uh, used in inter-regional settings. So Toronto, Montreal, uh, Ottawa, uh, Windsor, those are great candidate destinations for high-speed rail. Uh, but uh, in terms of intra-regional transportation, we in North America, Toronto lag behind much of Europe and Asia in terms of introducing electrification uh, of our rails. And that what that would do for our corridors is allow for, you know, 15, 10 minute service. And, and you'd, you wouldn't need these big, heavy 10 car train sets uh, rolling along. You could have much smaller, more compact uh, service uh, much more frequently. Uh, and, and again, I think that would 
only magnify the, the potential for positive impact here in Hamilton. Just in reflecting on the comment that you made about Young Street and the impact in terms of high density development and economic development along the subway stops, um, you know, we have, of course, in, in this region now, the last campaign having been largely fought municipally on the subject of the LRT and municipal transportation would appear now a path forward to the commencement of that project over time and its completion. Do you see that LRT project um, as having the same sort of positive economic impact um, as, um, for example, although admittedly different, the construction of the subway had uh, in Toronto over the years? Uh, or do you see it either being neutral um, or otherwise, I suppose, <clears throat> as it relates to Hamilton and its future? Yeah, we like we did the initial um, study for Hamilton when I was at Metrolinx uh, on LRT here in Hamilton, and um, um, so you know one of the innovations that I uh, uh, really thought was important during my time there was that as we did these studies uh, of these impact studies, that that we look at those three pillars that I talked about earlier that, that we consider the impact on the, the social health of, of communities, economic and environmental. So uh, our study around Hamilton uh, did come back uh, with a positive business case for LRT. So I, I do think that it, it will have um, uh, really beneficial effects on the city. I, I don't think, uh, I think it's difficult to compare it to a subway in Toronto where you, you have a kind of population mass uh, uh, that provides returns that are, are probably going to be uh, superior to what you would find here in Hamilton. So uh, in a relative way, no, probably not as positive as the subway, an extension of the Young Street line, but nonetheless uh, is an important driver for ha for the city of Hamilton. Let's transition from Metrolinks to your taking on the leadership of Mohawk College. Uh, quite a different institution, a different part of uh, uh, of our landscape, an institution today, uh, incidentally, which is really a pillar of, of the community and a significant educational resource for many economic sectors, including advanced manufacturing. But you didn't find it that way when you took on that role. Um, describe what it was and through your efforts, what the college has been transformed to be in this community today. Yeah, so uh, maybe just a couple of early comments around um, Mohawk, I, first of all, it, it's an extraordinary privilege uh, to be able to work uh, in post-secondary education and in the college sector in particular. And it, it, it's an enormously gratifying role to be the, a college president, I have to tell you. Um, when, when you preside over a convocation uh, of, a, of a college, um, they, it's an it's a incredibly emotional affair. People are frequently, you know, crying as they walk across the stage because in many cases they're the first person in their family ever to have uh, gone to post-secondary education and so there's this incredible pride uh, that takes place uh, and so it's it's very fulfilling uh, and there are very few jobs where you, you sort of get to see people you know the the raw product come in one end and 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 you're actually sitting at the end of the assembly line when you see the finished product roll uh, roll off the, the assembly line. So um, it, it's a wonderful thing. When I got to Mohawk, I think it it um, the first thing I'll say is it, it had great bones. Um, you know, so all of the potential in the world uh, already existed there. Uh, but I think that Mohawk had uh, it, it was my perception that that Mohawk. Uh, had sort of uh, lost some of its ambition. Uh, and so we, you know, when I came, we were not well ranked from a, a student uh, rankings perspective. And, and I said to people, look, um, we need to be the best. We need to be the best in Ontario for how our students uh, rank us. And I think that uh, people didn't believe that in the early going. Uh, and so, I feel like... Sorry, Rob, let me interrupt you. Was it that they didn't <coughs> believe that you needed to be the best or that you could be the best? Uh, that we could be the best. Okay. Um, and so, um, in some respects, I feel like I really gave permission 
to people there to believe we could be as good or better than anybody else in the province. Uh, and so we, you know, I set it as a real strategic objective that from a student satisfaction perspective, uh, we were going to, we we're going to get out of the bottom of the barrel, uh, and that, you know, we, we needed to be a premier community college, uh, within the province and, and ultimately, you know, achieved largely achieved that objective by the time, uh, I left, uh, five years later. Um, and I, you know, I think. It, it was interesting when I when I interviewed for that job. I was asked, "Do you, do you think Mohawk should be a place of access for students? In other words, you know, make sure that uh, whoever wants to come here can come here, and we do our best for them. Or do you think Mohawk needs to be a place of excellence uh, for students?" And I said, "Well, we need to be both. Uh, of course, it's a it's a critical role for community colleges to." Uh, provide upskill people who uh, don't have any skills and allow them to uh, get to a life where they can, you know, they can uh, live with dignity and earn a living wage and so on. But if that's all we are, if, if we're simply an access college, if we're simply the place that people go when they can't go anywhere else, uh, we are not doing our students any favors. So we also need to develop centers of excellence where students who are the best want to come here because they know they can get from us uh, a kind of level of excellence that they can't get anywhere else. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's that, if you're in the community college system, I, I really think you need to do both. You cannot take your eye off the community development role that a college has uh, that in, in terms of reaching out to every part of the community and saying, look, we're, we're a place where you belong. Uh, if you come here, uh, you'll belong. Uh, but we also need to uh, colleges to have a kind of luster to them that makes makes it clear that they're also a place where uh, you know the smartest people in the community can go and learn things that will help them to uh, further their careers. I take it you'd agree that that partnership within this community to exemplary educational institutions with with global reach and connection who work collaboratively together. Uh, in a community, of course, that is itself ambitious, creates a, a very differentiated value proposition for companies around the world that might be interested in connecting with innovation and skilled workers and considering whether to move to this region. Would you agree with that? Could you explore that with me a little? Yeah, I, well, I, you know, if, if I was on the international stage selling uh, the city of Hamilton, absolutely, I would be uh, promoting uh, the fact that we have these two uh, premier institutions, each uh, really uh, focused on its on their own swim lanes, but at the same time uh, uh, being able to uh, join up with each other uh, when it made sense to do so. So I, I think both McMaster and Mohawk are are key drivers and enablers of a successful business here in the region. They're they're both places that if I was op if you were opening up a business here. You can call up the president of Mohawk, and uh, you'll get your call returned. And uh, you know, um, I think there's there's lots of opportunities there for uh, collaboration, and, and there are. You know, it, it plays out in a in a meaningful way the the reach that Mohawk uh, and the university have into the community. That their connectedness with the community is is profound. The business community, in particular, and one of the I think the most significant beneficiaries of that collaborative approach has been Hamilton Health Sciences that draws on its relationship with both of those institutions in the service of this community. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about your leadership in this current role, but I'd like to take a moment to describe for those watching uh, what it is that Hamilton Health Sciences is. Beyond its, its size, uh, it's comprised of a variety of hospitals and facilities. It's the only hospital in Ontario that cares for all ages from pre-birth to end of life, offering world-leading expertise in many areas, including cardiac and stroke care, cancer care, palliative care, and pediatrics. You are a world-renowned hospital for healthcare <coughs> research, I presume drawing quite heavily uh, on your collaboration with McMaster. You're the largest employer in the greater Hamilton region. You play a vital role in training the next generation of health professionals in collaboration with, with the academic partners that we referred to a moment ago. 
um, and in, in what you do and who you represent, um, a very powerful and significant force in this community. Now, in taking the role on and in leading the organization in what is unquestionably one of the most regulated and challenging business environments, uh, what was it that you hoped to accomplish? <laughs> so, sir, what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> what were you thinking is probably a better question. Um, you know, like I would say across uh, my career, uh, I've not shied away f and in fact sort of run towards challenges. And it's so, you know, this was definitely a big challenge. And when the opportunity uh, was presented to me, it proved uh, irresistible. You know, for all those things you just said, uh, the, the opportunity to lead uh, a world-class institution is, is not something that comes along every day. And so that it proved uh, irresistible to me. Um, I, you know, uh, I think at the same time, lots and lots of challenges in, in at Hamilton Health Sciences, lots of challenges in healthcare. Uh, and so, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm hoping that I can leave uh, the hospital in a better place than I found it. Uh, it it's been, um, huge opportunity to work with, uh, you know, a huge array of brilliant people. Uh, and so it, uh, as much as the job has been hugely challenging, it's also been an extraordinary um, opportunity to, uh, to meet amazing people, to, um, you know, uh, develop systems, uh, processes, uh, and approaches uh, that I, I'm hoping can have a profound impact on the community ultimately. You didn't have a medical background, obviously, and you didn't come from uh, life sciences or medical fields and transitioning to, to Hamilton Health Sciences. And so it occurs to me that the learning curve uh, in taking on this role was enormous. How did you approach mastering the industry, uh, the sector, the organization in taking ownership and leadership of it? Yes, well, I, I'm not sure I've quite achieved mastery yet, but um, you know, I, I, I think I tried to do what I always do when I come into a new sector, and that is, uh, you know, to uh, a, be a humble leader, to uh, ask lots of questions, to be curious, uh, um, to make sure that I'm engaging a wide uh, array of people before I make. Uh, important decisions uh, so that I've got the best possible advice. Um, th this was, you know, this uh, place you could spend a lifetime learning uh, all there is to learn about Hamilton Health Sciences just because of uh, the scope and the scale uh, of what we do. So you really don't have any hope of, um, I, I mean, I'm being respectful to your question, but the idea that anybody could master uh, Hamilton Health Sciences, mm, pretty unlikely uh, just because of uh, how big it is. But <clears throat> um, it is, you know, it's been mostly for me about trying to bring some of those, the learnings I've, I've uh, been able to achieve in other sectors and try to introduce them uh, at Hamilton Health Sciences in a way that, you know, is, is beneficial. So I'm, like, I think the board was uh, <clears throat> pretty bold in choosing me to, to uh, take on the role. Uh, I think their view was uh, bringing some fresh eyes to the, to the scene would be helpful. So um, I, I've also tried to be mindful of that fact that I, you know, I, I wasn't brought here to just do what's always been done, uh, that I, I was brought here to try to bring some fresh new approaches to things. Uh, and so my, you know, ha having brought the diversity of experience that I have, I, I, I do have some, I, I have brought some ideas that I think uh, are, you know, uh, a little different than what the organization has uh, traditionally had. In transitioning to the role when you began, was there something that presented as um, an unexpected, <clears throat> unpleasant surprise organizationally in terms of challenge? Um, and conversely, was there um, a pleasant surprise that you had not anticipated in taking on the role that has aided your time here? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, if I start off with the negative, um, it, it's, you know, I frequently say I've never felt so broke with so much money uh, in my budget. Uh, we do, you know, we have a one and a half billion dollar budget approximately, uh, but it it feels like the ability uh, to innovate with that budget is so limited because, you know, the, the money is so uh, committed. I, like I, I marvel at the fact that I, you know, at Mohawk, I had more money in the president's office for innovation than I do at Hamilton Health Sciences, despite the fact that it's 10 times bigger. Uh, so the healthcare operates, it's a very stressed system and it operates on, on very tight margins. Um, I think what I'm, the opportunities that I uh, see out of this uh, that I'm, you know, uh, pretty excited about is just the, is this idea of creating a hospital without walls, the idea that the hospital has an opportunity to become uh, far more connected and integrated into the community than it has been in the past. And, you know, that's, that feels very much like my wheelhouse in terms, because of my career. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have been able to make some good progress and, and the current government is certainly encouraging uh, that very strategic direction. So how have you made that progress? How are you doing that? Well, it, it really started out um, uh, probably three years ago. We, we, Hamilton Health Sciences, in collaboration with others, convened a table uh, of community partners to really start the discussion about how, how can we, as a, a series of health uh, and social service providers, work better together. Uh, so that group has really been meeting for the last three years, talking about... Uh, and trying out new solutions, new approaches to how we can deal with some of the big, biggest challenges here in Hamilton when it comes to health uh, and, and the social scene here in Hamilton. I think that you know, the current government has certainly recognized that that is a, um, an approach that uh, uh, can bear big dividends. And so you know, we're currently in the process of working with essentially that same group on the development of our Ontario health team. So that that's really the direction that the current province, uh, provincial government is taking with respect to healthcare reform. So I feel like we're kind of three years ahead uh, of much of the rest of the province in terms of what the current government's directions are. <coughs> we had submitted to the prior government uh, what, what essentially was an Ontario health team proposal um, you know, before this government even came in. So I think we were, we were in a very strong position uh, relative to the current set of reforms. Does that working group comprise only public sector voices or does it also include representatives from private industry? It does include some representatives uh, uh, from private industry or, you know, uh, sort of the not in addition to the not-for-profit and the public sector. So it's, a, it's, an evolving, um, it's an evolving initiative, and I think the private sector will definitely have a role to play uh, as we move forward uh, in helping you know, make these things work. Uh, when you talk about, as you did, innovation and how constrained your budgets are and actually uh, actioning innovation within this industry, I'm also struck by the fact that in our legal industry, for entirely different reasons, funding and resourcing innovation is also a very significant challenge. Um, but in your efforts to square the circle and to innovate notwithstanding those restrictions, uh, how have you been creative in doing that? Do you feel that you're making headway in being innovative? And, and if you have, how have you accomplished that? <laughs> well, I think we're making some headway. Um... Uh, definitely uh, created the position of a chief innovation officer here at Hamilton Health Sciences. That was not something that we'd had previously and uh, recruited uh, uh, a great person, Ted Scott, uh, into that role. Uh, so I, I think on the, 
you know, on the technology side uh, of things, um, we're we're making some good progress. We, uh, you know, the first order of the day here at Hamilton Health Sciences when I came was to try to create some capacity for capital investment and very difficult to innovate in the absence of any uh, investment. So we've now done that. Uh, we went to, you know, market, uh, the capital markets uh, about six months ago uh, and uh, issued a debenture. Uh, and we're definitely uh, trying to use that money to transform the way Hamilton Health Sciences operates. And so uh, as we invest that money, I, you know, we're making it very clear this is about transformation uh, and not transformation for the sake of transformation, but uh, we're, we're looking for a very clear return uh, on the capital we're investing into the organization. It's, I, I think one of the, the peculiarities of, in healthcare when it comes to capital, uh, you know, the traditional uh, view of capital investment within healthcare was, was very much about this kind of arms race approach to developing, you know, technology with more bells and whistles. I think uh, increasingly going forward and certainly the case here at Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, capital investment is going to be about transformation and it's going to be about finding you know better more innovative ways to do things uh, so the next couple of years i think are going to be uh, exciting here uh, and i think we'll see an enormous amount of change uh, in the way we do things when i hear you give that answer uh, and reflect on innovation and a resolve to foster transformation I'm also hearing you say that that's not exclusively about technology, about bells and whistles, uh, but it's also about uh, people and how they engage with the community and behave and act, which to me speaks to the question of culture. And as a leader then, can you comment on the extent to which that question of culture, fostering an innovative culture, or other aspects of a culture that are supportive of the growth and health of the institution is at the center of your leadership here? Yeah, I, you know, I would say as as I think about transformation here at Hamilton Health Sciences, it, it is very much, uh, culture is very much on the agenda. Uh, and it's something that we've been working with, working on over the last couple of years because, uh, you know, while not uh, exclusive of one another, I think culture is something that we had an ability to begin thinking about and changing even in the absence of uh, a capacity for capital investment. So. Uh, you know, from we we've been very invested in the in the notion of continuous quality improvement uh, here at the hospital, and and ultimately, um, if we're going to succeed at that, it's going to be an exercise in culture change. Uh, if if we're going to really commit to uh, getting better every every day, every month, uh, every year uh, for our clients, our patients. Uh, it's going to be about having a culture of uh, quality improvement. So um, that is is uh, a lot about transitioning from a, a very hierarchical, top-down culture uh, to a culture where uh, there's a, a profound recognition uh, and embrace of the fact that you know value for our patients is created at the front line, at the coal face, at the place where our doctors and nurses meet our patients, uh, and that's where you know we will get the best ideas about how we can do better. Uh, and so it it's going from a, a very top down approach to very much a bottom up approach to how we recognize opportunities for improvement in the organization. In, re in reflecting on my engagement with, th with that issue and in listening to you talk about it, um, uh, my experience, and I'm, I'm interested in yours, is that that perspective is received differently depending upon who you are within the existing organization. Not every constituency necessarily welcomes hearing that approach. Um, to what extent has that been a challenge for you, or was it easy to get buy-in and adoption across the organization? <laughs> Um, I, I think in laughing, you're, you're probably answering the question for me, but can you comment on that? Well, I would probably start by saying nothing is easy in healthcare. 
<laughs> but and culture change is never easy. So, you know, I think at every level you will run into to resistance uh, uh, when it comes to culture change. And, and at this in this instance, as I talk about moving from uh, sort of hierarchy to um, uh, networks uh, and from command and control to enabled and empowered employees, you know, at the front line, the, there would be some employees who just want to come and do their job uh, and, and leave at the end of the day. And so the idea that um, we, we are trying to introduce a culture where for those people we're saying, no, uh, yeah, we do want you to do, do your job, but we also need you to help us figure out how you can make your job better. Um, for sure, there are always early adopters, but there are also people who are saying, look, just leave me alone. If uh, Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Uh, and, and so this is a very new idea for some of those people that it's like when they have a problem, they, they don't go to their boss and say, I need you to fix my problem. But their boss will increasingly say, well, how would you fix that problem? What do you think the best way to do uh, this uh, to get around that issue is? Uh, and then, you know, as you transition up the up the management, the chain of command, uh, you know, there are lots of people who have been working for many years in an environment where they expect to they they feel that they know all the answers, and uh, when they see a problem uh, that they need, they will simply issue uh, an order as to how uh, that problem is going to be fixed. And and telling those people, look, you might think that you know the right answer, but we need you to work with your employees to figure out to get to that answer, uh, or to whatever the answer may be. Lots of resistance there too, because it, it's a different kind of leadership style uh, to, uh, you know, engage in humble inquiry as opposed to simply saying, "Do this." You know, as you um, remark on on that, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that uh, that presents as incredibly powerful advice to existing leaders and those that aspire to be leaders in organizations. Uh, but it's also, in listening to it, something that seems to engage this question of, of resilience on the part of leaders, the persistence that's required to continue to move an organization forward in the face of those challenges is, is daunting. And, and I'm sure you've experienced that throughout your career. Can you comment on what has kept you going, what advice that you would give leaders or aspiring leaders in, in tackling transformative change as it, as it relates to persistence and resilience? How have you done that? You know, I met a guy uh, in the, the United States named Paul O'Neill, who's a former uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, under Bush too, and uh, former uh, CEO of Alcoa. And uh, you know, I, he's a, he's a fascinating guy. And I took away sort of three rules from him from my conversations with him for successful organizations. He's, you know, essentially, I think what he would say is. You need to achieve three things uh, if you want your organization to succeed. You you need to everybody needs to feel valued and respected. Everybody uh, needs to understand how their job uh, helps contribute to the vision and mission of the organization. Everybody needs to have the right tools uh, to do their job. They, they sound like three simple things. Uh, you can actually impact them uh, and th they mean a lot and they're actually very difficult things. And it's quite amazing how many organizations I've seen where one or more of those things simply isn't true uh, and which ultimately um, limits the, the, the degree to which uh, that organization uh, can succeed. Um, but those three rules have been top of mind for me since I came here, uh, and I've been pushing on each of them. Uh, you're right, uh, leadership is a lot about uh, resilience, but uh, I think you know leaders need to have a really clear vision, an inspiring vision of where they want to take a place uh, and commit to it and do it in the context of those three things. Uh, and I think, as I said, sort of at the outset, that if you have that, it's a lot easier to get out of bed in the morning. Lastly, Rob, uh, you're a longtime Hamiltonian. 
you've seen the city change and evolve over many, many years. You're deeply connected. Are you optimistic? And, and if you are, why? Look, I'm, I'm hugely op optimistic for uh, where Hamilton's at. I, um, I'm going to sound a little like Bob Bratina here, the former mayor of Hamilton. But, you know, when I was a kid, uh, even though uh, I was, I grew up just across the bay in Aldershot. Uh, I was born here in Hamilton, lived here for a while, and then we moved to Aldershot. But um, this was this was absolutely the place I would come from ages, you know, well, as a kid, I would come here uh, on Saturday mornings and meet my grandmother. We'd have breakfast uh, at Eaton's. Um, it, it was such an incredibly vibrant, vibrant place. My dad, who worked at Westinghouse, uh, used to, he had a lot of corny sayings for sure, but he used to say, you know, if you stood long enough at the corner of King and James, you'd meet everybody in the world. And he kind of had that feeling back then because you, you, it was such a busy place. The, the sidewalks were bustling with people and people from all walks of life. Uh, and so that's how I got to know Hamilton. Uh, and then it started this long, decades long, uh, decline, uh, which was very painful to watch. Um, but, uh, and lots of kind of false starts, but I, in terms of heading back up, but I, I I'm very confident that it, 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 uh, Hamilton has now sort of figured out, uh, the secret sauce for coming back. Uh, it's, it's hard for me not to relate it to my broader views about the importance of the city region. And so we have this, incredible um, position as as being part of one of the most successful city regions in North America in terms of growth and prosperity. And so I think, you know, what I've been saying for many years is that there is this wave of prosperity that will overtake Hamilton. Uh, and what our local city leaders can do is either let it wash over us uh, and you know be whatever it can be, uh, or they can really try to ride it and shape it in a way that maximizes uh, that for the city of Hamilton. So I, I think Hamilton is going to succeed uh, either superbly well because uh, the city has helped to shape it or in spite of the city, but I think success is headed our way. Rob McIsaac, thank you for spending time with us today. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for listening to the Accelerating Business Podcast, powered by Galling WLG. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, please visit gallingwlg.com Accelerate Podcast.